According to the best information that we can obtain, Patrick was born in 385 in Banhaven Tabernier in the present-day Scotland, although that is disputed, and he would seem to have adopted the name Patrick so as to be more accessible to the Roman ambit, and his natural name would have been more Celtic, Maywin Sikat, which has a Welsh sound to it. Remember that these areas were all interlinked, Cumbria, the south of Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, and they had this Celtic bond between them. So the name Patricius would have come in at that point and stuck. He had a good formation being of this Latin stock on his father's side who had the name of Calpurnius who was a deacon in that local church and was himself the son of a priest it would seem. So he had this grounding, the young Patrick, in the cursus studiorum of the time in grammar and then he had to complete the cursus of rhetoric, rhetorica, but he was snatched as a slave by these Irish slave traders, which explains how he found his way unexpectedly at the age of 16 here to Ireland. It was there in the Schlemisch area in the north that he was brought into intimacy with heaven in the simplicity of the life of a herdsman, a pastor, who was looking after the animals in the quiet of nature. So we know from his own writings that he had this access to the Lord by many prayers, a hundred in the day and as many if not more by night. The Lord himself therefore was his interior master. But this was also providential in so far as he could but learn the language and the customs of the place. And therefore after six years he understood how the Irish ticked and had their language. Either he was freed or he escaped six years later and found his way after some dramatic movements because he nearly starved to death to his home place and family. But by then he was being worked upon strongly by divine grace and felt the call to give himself entirely to the Lord. And he left his land of birth, his land of origin, and went to Gaul, where he took up studies. And it would seem that he was under the protection of the great bishop of Auxerre, Germanus, Saint Germain d'Auxerre, who was a great man with regard to his influence over the Celtic Church, notably in defending it against the heresy of Pelagianism. In Wales today, we still have my Scarmon, the field of Carmon, that's Germanus, where the victory of Easter was fought without bloodshed. According to the story which has come down to us, the whole huge army just cried out the Easter cry of Alleluia, and the whole sound of this gigantic army re-echoed through the valley, and the even greater number of local enemies thought there was a huge, huge army coming against them because of the echoing effect of the sound, and fled. And it's called the Alleluia Victory to this day. And the place is Maiscarmon. So, this was the man who formed him, protected him, and he had the wish to become a missionary back in Ireland. He had been ordained deacon by this bishop. But his superiors would not let him go because they did not think him sufficiently adequate for the char task. And so it seems that he went at that point to the holy island of Lerins, 
still there in the south of France and still a centre of monastic life to this day. The Cistercians are there and they have a very good monastic life, very faithful. Interestingly enough, with slight Byzantine influences, notably in the chant. There he would have come in deliberate contact with the whole monastic world coming from all sides because that was the bridge also with the eastern monastic world through St. John Cassian who had been there and he had codified as it were the best of the spirituality of the monastic east. So he Patrick would have been exposed to all this richness and he was also listening to how these monks were able to evangelize for they did many things. They were ready to go wherever the spirit moved them and they know how to knew how to hit hard and so he learnt the tricks of the trade from listening to how these monks had had success elsewhere. Remember how over the centuries great monks like Boniface, William Broad, and so on, have also been great evangelizers. Now, Palladius had been made bishop for the Christians who might be already in Ireland and would have had a missionary thrust, but he fell ill. And it was at that point that recommendation was given to the Pope, that this man, Patrick, was the one for the work. He then was consecrated missionary bishop for Ireland. I believe the Pope was Celestine who sent him, and so he came, and he, being a gentle boy, knew how to use a way of collusion with what was good there rather than of suffocation of the same and it was his secret he where possible christianized what was usable and he also knew how to handle well the structure of tribal authority each part of the country would be under a king and he would get to that king and therefore eventually the rest would follow. It was therefore a fairly peaceful evangelization and the opposition strangely enough would often come from some form of Christians notably Pelagian heretics. However grace won through and St. Patrick was keen on emphasizing the importance of the work of divine grace, which the Pelagians were tending to minimize, as though man was sufficient without the help of God. That is simplifying the thing, but however, there is some of that there, and we find it again also in modern times in different forms. Grace is always the first mover. Even the grace to respond to grace is a grace. However, there is responsibility. We can say no. By the way, there was the intermediate doctrine of semi-Pelagianism, and Cassian was actually wrongly accused of something of that. It is interesting to note in parenthesis that the Saint of Wales, St. David, became famous as a preacher precisely in combating this heresy. And according to the story, he was preaching and could not be heard because of the very large number of people who had come. And he had the inspiration to put under him this blessed white cloth, to stand upon it and to carry on preaching and the Lord himself performed a miracle that they might all be able to hear the ground on which he stood then rose and Brevi became Clan Dewi Brevi, the church of Brevi, of Dewi in Brevi where the mountain, the little hill can be seen to this day. It rose there under his feet, the first megaphone of history. And by the way, St. Patrick also 
went to Glenrossin, the present Minevia, St. David's, and he was given to understand that that was not for him, but for a saint who would follow him. It was David, some time later. Patrick is very early, 385. So, he is made bishop in 460 and finds his way back to Ireland. And there we have the progressive monasticization of the country. He himself was keen on producing a diocesan system as he had found on the continent, but the monastic world was very prominent from the beginning in Irish history, and it is linked also with the social structure. A noble family who might want to, as it were, sort out one of the sons, could endow an area with a monastery of which the son then would become the abbot. It was a way also of keeping things in social security, for in the tribal system the abbots would remain within the same clan and family. It gave a certain security, but then these monasteries had an impact socially because they became places of formation on the intellectual level and on the cultural level. They kept culture. The monks became experts not only in agriculture but also in the transmission of learning, notably through the copying of manuscripts and the illustration of the same. And we know what brilliant examples came from Ireland, still with us to this day, the Book of Kells and so on. And so these monasteries also helped on a social level with the knowledge of medicine as it was being kept in these places. Certain pharmaceutical expertise would be able to be used and harnessed in a safe place, which would explain also why they were centres and targets when it came to plundering when the Vikings eventually came along. And so this is our origin peaceful conquest where grace was able to heal. The problem was that there was a very powerful infrastructure of pagan cult there to be overcome. The Druids had power. The sun was greatly honoured, as we see just nearby here, from the effort given to honouring it at New Grange. This perfect phenomenon which happens still and also it would be happening at Nowth and Douth, all linked with points of the year with regard to the solar trajectory. Same thing happens in Stonehenge, of course, with regard to trapping, tapping the power of the sun. The sun was the greatest power known, and they were going into the dark, hoping for the best when it came to death. And so death is linked with these places of worship, and death brings fear. And the Druids had power, so he had to fight against all this priestly caste of Druids around, and he won through. We know the story with regard to Slain nearby here, how he lit this fire of spring, the Paschal fire, which we still light every year. And the king saw it on the nearby hill of Tara, and one of his... Men said, if that fire remains lit until morning, it will never be extinguished, emitting thus a prophecy without knowing it, for it did remain kindled until dawn and is still with us. This then is the power of this saint. This then is the power of grace. And the readings for this day indicate the power of the word, the power of preaching, the apostles go, Jeremiah is given words of fire, and the Lord sends out his disciples to prepare the way for the coming of the fount of grace, the Messiah himself. They go in fellowship, two by two, and Patrick also knew how to influence people on a personal level. Indeed, according to tradition, his most dear companion and friend and Protégé, Keenan, founded this place, Dulik, which means Church of Stone, and therefore this place goes back to the first generation. Dulik would be a disciple of St. Patrick, and this would have been a bishopric still at the time of the Synod of Kells, in the 1100s. And so we know already 
that there was a center of prayer in this little place from the earliest time. As in Wales, we find that villages grew up and they all have this in common, that they have the name of a clan or of Betus or something which means church. Clan actually means enclosure and the church would have been in the enclosure. Betus means bead house, it's the church. The tradition that Dulik was the first stone-built church in Ireland is ancient, and it could be that the word would be linked with the Welsh Tilech, house of stone or slate. Whatever it is, the ancient nature of these places of prayer reminds us that we belong to something outside time, for these saints have gone before us, marked with the sign of faith, and waiting for us on the other shore. But before they went there, they left monuments of heroic sanctity, such as those extreme points of contact between heaven and earth on the western fringe. Skellig Michael is a dramatic example. They looked for the equivalent of the desert in the monastic world of the west. The sea and the mountains would separate from noise, and it was a genuine separation, for on Skellig Michael one is completely removed from the rest of the world. It's a risky thing to go rowing for five hours from there to the mainland, and so they would be remaining there for years on end. Actually, the same thing happened in Wales over the water. We see on Anglesey how they looked also for similar places, and there are little islands dotted around where there would have been saints praying. Even Hollyhead itself was a place where St Cubby was praying. With regard to these places, they do favour intimacy with heaven. St. Patrick also has left traces on that part of the world. There are churches dedicated to him, Cornwall and Wales. There is a church on Anglesey, which according to an unbroken local tradition, was actually set up by Patrick himself, Edwis Badrick, and it, it seems that the Anglicans are not handling tradition lightly there because they have these old churches and they know where they came from, and often they're very quaint and very prayerful. Sometimes times stand still in moments of timelessness where saints have prayed and met heaven before time ran out. In Wales we also have the holy island of Bardsey, near where actually we live, and there is there a very strong sense of the past still present. According to an ancient tradition, 20,000 saints are buried there. People wanted always to be buried there. It is on the extreme end of West Wales and difficult to get to because of the sound. Sumt, the wind and the sea are dangerous and people have lost their lives trying to get there. But there also there is a place of prayer. People go there, especially in the summer months, and there is no contamination from the hustle and bustle in life. So the same things have the same effect. And we need to bear in mind that these saints had their effect because grace was free to act in them. They did not make a great croisonnement between active and contemplative life because they were always gazing at Christ. But that same Christ could send them and send them he did. They were free to move, as indeed were the disciples that the Lord commissioned. They sent, they were sent out without baggage. They were sent out depending on providence. Well, so too, these saints were free to fly. And they conquered for Christ with the power of warmth and of the word. Indeed, Christ was conquering in them. A secret, perhaps, that we could take with us before we sit down to plan perfectly our pastoral programme, perfectly engineered, perfectly calculated, but where man is in control, whereas God is just waiting for freedom to act, indeed permission to act, when we abstain from too much noise which gets in the way.